Now we are entering a totally new phase. It's what I call jihad of atmosphere. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Uncommon Decency. Samuel Paty was a dedicated professor who died on the line of duty for having taught a class on freedom of expression that used cartoons of Mohammed. He was decapitated by a young Chechen refugee, a tragic reminder of France's profound tensions on the question of its identity and unity. On this episode, we are lucky to have Gilles Capel, one of France's most distinguished scholars on Islamist extremism. Listeners of this episode will notice that Gilles Kepel pulls no punches on foreign media, whose covering of the attack, like, of, like their covering of many other previous attacks, has tended to portray laïcité, France's distinguished regime for keeping the public and the religious spheres separate, as some sort of thinly veiled racist system. Remember, by the way, to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, as that would really help others find out about Uncommon Decency. Let's bring it on. We hope you'll enjoy the episode. We have the honour today of having Gilles Capel. Gilles Capel is a doctor in political science and sociology. He's a professor at Sciences Po and at the Normal Sup School, and a senior fellow at the LSE. He's a respected expert on the Arabic world and political Islam. And he's written many books on these two issues, including his latest work, Away from Chaos, the Middle East and the Challenge to the West, which is really a fascinating deep down analysis of the rise of power of political Islam in what used to be a nationalist and secular Middle East and the impact of its transformation on Europe. Gilles Capel, thank you for coming on Common Decency. My pleasure. So we originally, we originally wanted to talk about Emmanuel Macron's law and separatism. But given the tragic events of last Friday, I think it's important we talk about what happened in some detail. I think most people are familiar with what happened now. A middle school professor, Samuel Petit, was killed by an 18-year-old Chechen refugee for having shown cartoons of Mohammed in a middle school class on free speech. Can you walk us through what happened to that professor from the moment he showed those cartoons in his class to two weeks later when he was decapitated by this young Chechen refugee? How did we get from here? Well, thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to uh, discuss those uh, tragic events, in particular with our uh, British and American friends, because there's always a lot of misunderstanding on both sides of the Channel or the Atlantic on those issues. Even the vocabulary that we use is difficult to translate, and the concepts that they carry is, uh, is at times not exactly the same. Uh, when we translate uh, French laïcité with secularism, it doesn't cover exactly the same span. Mm. Even banlieue uh, has to be translated as banlieue mm. now uh, because uh, it doesn't mean suburbia, it doesn't mean outskirts, it rather means inner cities in Britain or projects in America. So it, the, the connotation system is totally different. Mm. Anyway, so uh, actually what happens uh, in uh, Conflans saint honorine which is a place in the outskirts of Paris, it's not really a banlieue in social terms. It's it's a it's a, an, a city which is uh, half residential, half uh, working class. It's not it's not a project, if I if I may say so, um, at all. Uh, took place, uh, um, you know, uh, less than two weeks after. Uh, Emmanuel Macron's speech on Islam mm -hmm. separatism. And um, in a way, it illustrates uh, what uh, the French president said. Uh, his, his aim in delivering this speech was the following. You know, uh, France and another of other European countries had been hit uh, very severely by jihadist uh, uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, Britain was not spared that, uh, whether it be in Manchester of late, on Westminster mm -hmm. Bridge, uh, Germany as well, in uh, in uh, Pichardsenplatz in, in Berlin, in Munich, uh, Barcelona, uh, and France was, uh, Belgium also at the airport and also in uh, in the the European um, district in the center of the city, and uh, but France was particularly hit, uh, and um, 
if you if you read uh, Islamist uh, literature, uh, they clearly uh, have a grudge against uh, against the French because mm. to them uh, the French epitomize the um, precisely this laicity, i.e., a secularism which they believe is uh, the uh, the uh, the opposite of uh, the way they see uh, religion as as a principle as as a worldview to whom uh, everybody should be submitted i mean islam means submission or even subservient you might may say so and um, now this you know after many uh, uh, come and go and many hesitations uh the the intelligence services of uh of europe uh learned from their mistakes and they managed to be uh relatively uh efficient in terms of tracking those groups in terms of understanding uh the rationale of islamist uh, uh radical uh, and jihadist movements from Al Qaeda to ISIS, understanding how the, their, their sort of intellectual software had changed and everything, mm. uh, and it so happens that nowadays, you know, the um, ISIS, uh, which was a sort of bottom-up terrorism, far more than Al Qaeda, which was top-down, and uh, which ISIS, the the sort of last wave or third wave of jihadism, the first one being Afghanistan in the 1980s, the second between Al-Qaeda in uh, the late 1990s and the two, first decade of the 2000s, and ISIS being the third. The difference between um, Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS being that um, Al-Qaeda would, you know, typically uh, uh, pay for uh, uh, lessons to uh, in order to, to be the pilot of the plane, send people to those schools, then send the guys in the planes, send the planes in the towers or in the Pentagon, and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Uh, but they had no relation uh, to the to the grassroots in a way, and mm -hmm. uh, the the sort of uh, uh, very impressive media impact did not really translate into the action they wanted, i.e. seizing power and toppling the infidel regimes. Mm -hmm. Then the lessons learned from the failures uh, of Al-Qaeda from a political point of view uh, uh, led to uh, the, a book by a famous, um, or online book by, by a famous jihadist ideologue who was the former uh, PR person for Ben Laden, a Syrian by the name of Abu Musab al-Suri, who was partially educated in France, mm. then married a Spaniard, and finally uh, settled in London. So he was a perfect European, knew the old continent rather well, noticed that there were many disenfranchised Muslims living there, noticed mm. that Salafism had made inroads into those milieus, and then thought that these were the ones who would start the big destabilization of the West coming from Europe. America was too far away, too complicated. There was a big ocean in the middle. Mm. Europe was near. Uh, the Mediterranean is easy to cross. And there are millions of um, of young people who, uh, many of them, he, would, he thought, would be uh, uh, interested in this ideology. So he, you know, insisted that, you know, you can use a knife, you can use use your car, you can use whatever you want. You don't need to follow orders. You can take things into your hands. This is going to lead to a massive and a disproportionate reaction from Western authorities. Then all Muslims will side with you, and mm. this will be the beginning of the end for the infidel West. Okay. Now, this was then put into action by ISIS, uh, when ISIS established this uh, rogue caliphate in uh, uh, Syria and, and Iraq. But this rogue caliphate, being a caliphate, was bombed by superior uh, air force forces from uh, the, the Europe, America, and some Arabs. And then it disappeared. And it was from the ISIS rogue caliphate that we had some such attacks as the Bataclan attack, the Brussels attacks and the like, and many others, but this is not yet perfectly documented. Now, we, now we are entering a totally new phase. It's a new step where uh, it's what I called in, in a piece I, 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 pub I published in Le Monde uh, um, 
an, an, a jihad of atmosphere. I don't know how to translate it in English, actually. Um, that is to say that you don't need people to give you orders. Uh, you don't need a network, really. Uh, you, you're just part and parcel of, of, of a culture, uh, of, uh, of a sort of breakaway culture. This breakaway culture, which then Macron would call separatism, leads you to consider that the laws of the infidel state of France, of Britain, of Germany, of uh, Sweden, Italy, or what have you, is not something to, ca- to which you have to pay allegiance. You can pay lip service uh, for tactical reasons, but ultimately you don't believe in it. And you have to um, uh, severe your links from them. This sort mm-hmm. of severance uh, is extremely important. And this severance uh, leads to the fact that when time has come, you are legitimate to attack and, uh, you know, to kill an apostate, an infidel, or what have you. This was already put into action from nineteen, from 2012, sorry, in France by Mohamed Merah, mm-hmm. who in Toulouse and Montauban killed Jewish pupils in a school because, mm-hmm. as Suri uh, had written in his uh, online essay, uh, you know, uh, every Arab uh, hates the Jews, so he thought, and then this is going to expand our scope outside the, the smaller sort of jihadi milieu and also kill French soldiers from what he thought was Muslim descent. And this happened also in Britain mm. when uh, uh, British soldiers from uh, Indo-Pakistani descent were targeted uh, mm. because they were traitors. They were apostates. And therefore, you know, in order to have a pure community, you had to kill the, the ones who had deviated. Now, this was, you know, uh, ISIS gave a, a, some sort of organization to that. Nowadays, uh, you know, the, thing, the, the phenomenon is different because in the past, uh, until recently, until, say, a couple of years ago, we were faced with an attack that was spectacular, that was unexpected. And you had then to go back into the past to, to uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, understand, uh, collect the bits and pieces to 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 understand, the, you know, the, the the process that would lead mm-hmm. to to the spectacular attack, bombing, uh, slaughter, and what have you. You're talking about a Bataclan attack, just in say, so, yeah, Bataclan, for instance, mm-hmm. or, or or what is happening, I know, uh, in Paris uh, those days, and this is why this um, what happened is even more striking. We have the huge trial of the 2015, January 2015 attacks, mm-hmm. shot in the hyper kosher uh, shop. Uh, and uh, while the, this happens, we have a reenactment to some extent of this phenomenon because the, uh, the, the, the cause or the pretext of, of what happened was that a teacher had displayed a cartoon of, uh, of the prophet so that uh, kids could uh, think in the sort of civic education class on uh, what is blasphemy and mm-hmm. uh, or freedom of expression and what have you. Now, uh, how did this uh, take place? And this is uh, uh, answer now the core of your question. Uh, the uh, sorry for taking some time for the. No, it's important. The context is important. The, for the introduction. Uh, the um, the when was the following? This middle school teacher, I mean, uh, taught kids who were between twelve, thirteen, whatever, in what is called the fourth and third grade, fourth grade in France. Mm-hmm. Uh, let us say the th- third year of uh, middle, uh, middle, yes, middle yeah, yeah exact more or less. It would be um, change in America and in, in Britain and mm-hmm. France, and the like. so twelve years old usually. Um, showed them uh, this cartoon. Uh, then the father of one of the female pupils uh, posted uh, a tweet, I think, uh, that said that it was a scandal that mm-hmm. the teacher had singled out Mus- uh, Muslim pupils, asked them to raise their hand, say, you can leave the class if you think you're going to be offended, and you'll come back, and we're going to discuss Islam and the Prophet and what have you. So, 
Then this tweet went viral because uh, the father said that uh, this was uh, discriminatory, uh, that Muslims were singled out, plus uh, he was uh, uh, defiling the, the prophet, that was an insult, and then so on and so forth, that uh, the teacher was not a teacher, but he was, um, how do you say, um, a voyou, uh, a scoundrel. Mm. A scoundrel. Yeah, a scoundrel, sorry. And uh, that um, uh, then people had to, Muslims had to mobilize. Now, this was uh, based on facts that were not uh, completely true. First, his daughter was not there. She had been expelled from school before uh, for a couple of days because of misconduct. And uh, also, uh, the uh, teacher did not single out the Muslim students and whatever. He said that whoever wanted to leave would leave. Huh? Now, I do not contend that. I don't say that the, uh, what the teacher did may have been done uh, uh, more astutely, uh, uh, to quote unquote. I.e., uh, uh, he uh, he probably w was uh, was not very skillful in his way of teaching. But this is does not, of course, justify. What, uh, ha what happened before. So the video went viral, and uh, the, it went viral all the more so because this, this father, uh, whom my students who work on uh, Islamist movements in France online so knew very well, actually, because he, on his um, Twitter account and Facebook wall, he was friends with the uh, if I may say so, the Dick, Tom, and Jerry of of the whole uh, uh, French Islamist uh, Gotha, and mm -hmm. so uh, he reached out to them immediately. They retweeted, and it was also retweeted by uh, a very uh, important mosques in the uh, banlieues of Paris in Pantin, where a, a very uh, rigorous uh, Salafi imam makes the Friday uh, sermon. Uh, trained in Yemen in a Salafi school, school in Yemen called Dammaj. Mm. Then uh, he also got in touch with a famous uh, radical Islamist agitator, uh, the head of a, a self-styled Sheikh Yassin committee, uh, who was trying to organize solidarity with Hamas uh, mm. amongst French Muslims. Arafat was a traitor and the like, and who spotted a number of actions against Jews and against Muslims who had any relations with Jews. In particular, he persecuted another imam uh, by the name of Shalgumi, uh, who had uh, good relations with the Jewish institutions and the like. And he's, he was a provocateur mm -hmm. for many years. He's, uh, in his, in his, in, he is in his 60s. And um, but he was always very careful, uh, you know, not to to come under the the scope of uh, of the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, then the two of them went to see uh, the school uh, principal, or director, headmaster, a headmistress actually, and said that the the, the professor, the teacher, should be ousted, mm -hmm. which is very strange. Uh, and uh, and then they, they bragged about it in another video and so on and so forth. And then uh, there was, and this is still unknown, uh, the uh, the investigation is, is actually uh, being made. Uh, it is being said that he was, uh, the father was contacted by this Chechen guy. We do not know whether they knew each other previously, but we know that the guy was 18 that uh, he had, uh, over the last six months, at least started to put a number of uh, radical Islamist pro-jihad posts on his uh, 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 Facebook, Twitter, uh, account, yeah. Twitter account and whatever, and that he went to some uh, uh, gym uh, that was under the control of uh, radical Islamists. You know, we, you have this whole network, there's an atmosphere of of uh, some mosques, some uh, schools, uh, which Triple are clubs. private, yeah, uh, some gyms, some halal shops, and the like. And uh, to what extent was he? Uh, did he get the idea himself? Uh, was it part and parcel of something that he shared with others? Because a couple of weeks before a Pakistani uh, refugee, because he also both had refugee status into France, can you imagine? Also done the same, uh, had tried to um, butcher with a butcher's knife, a cutlass, 
um, two people who just happened to work in a building that had been uh, Charlie Hebdo's building. Uh, they had nothing to do with it. He tried to to behead them, uh, and probably because he had he you know he spoke no French, no English, but he he um, he was uh, always on his smartphone looking at what happened in Pakistan, and in pa he also had been socialized with a radical Islamist group there. And in Pakistan, he saw all those huge demonstrations after Shahni Abdo republished mm -hmm. the cover of the 2015 um, issue okay. led to the tragedy. And, you know, it was something that they do as a, mem as a sort of mem memorial work. Uh, tout ça pour ça, all that, only for that. I mean, this was sort of a reflection on it. But it was taken at first degree. And then there was a huge array of fury, and uh, uh, you know, blasphemers should be beheaded, and um, and then so this this is the, the general context. Now, from what uh, we we understood, he, he went to he he traveled. Uh, it's sort of eighty kilometers, was maybe fifty miles or something, from where he lived in Evreux, which is also further. Uh, uh, far, far, further away from Paris to uh, Conflans Saint Honorine, mm -hmm. uh, with a knife. Then uh, tried to see who the teacher was. Uh, bribed some kids, uh, some pupils. Gave him some. Uh, he had three hundred euros. We heard uh, to know to exactly track him, and he followed him, and then beheaded him, and put the the head on Twitter with a comment saying that. Uh, uh, Macron, king of, in, uh, of infidels, uh, uh, should beware because he killed one of his dogs and he's going to kill many others. And uh, this and the, the video, uh, I mean, it was not a video, the, the photo mm. uh, on the tweet looked exactly like, uh, you know, images posted by Daesh that took place mm. in, uh, on Syrian or Iraqi territory, uh, you know, like jihadi John beheading. Uh, yeah. uh, Hostages, British soldiers, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the uh, so this is this sent, of course, uh, a, a major shockwave because um, you know this was a man who was a middle school teacher, mm -hmm. and the fact that one would behead uh, a middle school teacher and who someone who, in the French uh, sort of uh, state mythology, is the is the pillar mm -hmm. on which the whole modern republic uh, uh, as it came out of the enlightenment is it's founded it's, it's the cornerstone if you want mm. and uh, i believe that this was uh, th th this was why there was such a shock and and, uh, mm. and horror and um, even though the response was not as uh, uh, huge, not the same magnitude as uh, had been the case in 2015, when you had millions of people demonstrating in the whole of France and mm. uh, with you know heads of states, heads of states of the whole world who, who came, mm. and uh, this was this is, was a much more restrained uh, solidarity in the streets. Uh, there's going to be later today uh, a national homage and the Sorbonne symbol of the, the French uh, university by mm. President Macron and uh, with a restricted attendance because we live under COVID also. Mm. Uh, and that's that's the general context. So as uh, uh, the response of the state was to uh, arrest those people, the, except the, the Chechen who had been killed by the police, um, uh, seven of them were uh, sent after uh, they had been taken in custody to uh, to a judge to be incriminated, and then uh, then the the uh, the instruction of the of the affair will uh, the investigation the the judiciary investigation will uh, will start. So uh, they'll have lawyers on their side and everything, and uh, that's uh, so that's where we are. Uh, it has stirred a, a very strong uh, debate in France and particularly. Uh, about the kind of the, the new dimension of this uh, uh, jihadism, which I mentioned uh, earlier on, and uh, mm. I've been one of the, the atmosphere jihadism. Yeah, I think yeah. It. and uh, 
Mr. Kipel, this is incredibly useful to our audience and, and it really is worth everyone's while to go down to the granular level and really explain kind of what are, what are some of the details that I think the international press is glossing over. Uh, but I want to take a broader look into how Islamism has is, is sort of like taken a hold of, of some of these territories in France over the years. Uh, you wrote a book, um, you wrote a couple of books, La Fracture in, in 2016, Terror dans l'Hexagone in, in 2015. And I, I wonder if... Um, so in English, as Terror in France, published by Princeton, University of Princeton. Oh, got it. So that our, our audience can also uh, head over to the English version of that, Terror in France by Princeton Press. Um you know, you, you were mentioning earlier, obviously, we've also had some of these attacks in London, Barcelona, Munich, but none, none of which were nearly as, none of which were remotely as deathly as Le Bataclan. Uh, France has really kind of, um, you know, uh, just taken a huge hit in terms of just the, the toll and, and how deathly these attacks have been um, to the point where this is really shaping the world's view of France. I mean, in, in so many ways, all of which are, are negative. Um and, and, and can you sort of walk us through the recent history of France? How, um, obviously, you've, you've just explained kind of how uh, these networks went from being very top, bo top to bottom to be, being more sort of um, bottom up and, 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 and that sort of breakaway um, uh, mentality. Um, but how, how has France evolved to become the hotspot of where this sentiment is most deeply kind of rooted? How, how did that happen? Well, uh, it's a complicated set of issues, and uh, I, I do not have the pretense to put them in the right order, but uh, uh, historically, uh, France uh, was, uh, as was the case with uh, Britain, uh, uh, mainly a colonial power, except that uh, British colonies were far away. I mean, the, the bulk of the British colonial empire was, was India. And uh, India is separated uh, by oceans and another continent, Africa, from, from the, the continent. So even though there were a number of uh, people from the former Raj, uh, i.e. India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Ceylon and the like, who uh, came to, in, to Britain uh, in the post-World War II period as immigrant workers and who settled there and then sort of molded themselves on a sort of, a, how should I say, a communalist system. You know, uh, the Raj was administered as uh, Muslims versus Hindus versus Sikhs and so on and so forth. And everybody would, would retain his uh, uh, sort of identity within this huge uh, uh, thing that was the Indian subcontinent. Uh, but by the same token, uh, Britain, as, it's, as it calls itself, is a united kingdom, or maybe disunited, disuniting kingdom, uh, particularly when we think of Scotland, but also Wales, uh, Ireland, of course, and whatever now, and the Brexit phenomenon may be part and parcel of, a, of an old a British tradition of uniting and disuniting also. And when uh, people from the subcontinent uh, settled in Britain, in a way, they became uh, uh, something else under the British aegis. I mean, they would be, you could become British, but you could not become English. You had to be English, right, or Scot, or whatever. And therefore, uh, the sort of uh, communal, pluralistic um, system uh, sort of uh, allowed for um, what we in France call insertion rather than integration, i.e. the communities were inserted, uh, but they remained communities as, as such with their morals, with everything. Uh, and, you know, the general feeling was that, after all, what was important was that market forces would make uh, buyers, uh, consumers, and sellers of all those people. And that who cared whether uh, they did not... Uh, uh, abide by the same uh, rules, uh, if not minimally. Uh, the, the French case is quite different because the uh, most of the colonial um, uh, parts of the French uh, Empire were very close, except from Indochina. Uh, but uh, it was on the other side of the Mediterranean, across a sea which is easy to cross, and then went down to uh, Western and Central Africa. Uh, predominantly uh, Muslim, 
and uh, whereas the the, uh, the Raj was predominantly Hindu, and uh, with uh, uh, a tradition of colonialization, colonialism, which was different with the the feeling that you know uh, they were different, but nevertheless, the the elites would uh, would become uh, French to some extent, uh, that uh, they would have access to the Enlightenment culture, and this was also a, a way of thinking, or maybe a mythology, if you'd rather, that would translate into the migration phenomenon, particularly. After 1973, uh, when the oil prices skyrocketed and the, the sort of to and fro movement of immigration stopped, those who were already in Europe would stay there, bring their families, and uh, supposedly no newcomers would be allowed legally. Many uh, came for di different way, in different ways. but uh, And then the, there was this feeling in France in particular that just like the French school system, the French centralized secular school system, had made uh, Britons or Alsatians or uh, whatever, or uh, Occitans into Frenchmen, they, it would make uh, little kids from uh, Algerian, Moroccan, Tunisian, or Senegalese origin into Frenchmen. Uh, this uh, took place while uh, Europe and not only France lived in a tremendous recession where uh, the families of those kids were very often uh, unemployed and uh, when prospects for jobs did not correspond to what uh, to the expectations they got in the schools. And this took place when leftism started to, uh, to, to disintegrate, when the unions uh, were insignificant for people who had no jobs, and where uh, the traditional left-wing ideologies sort of lost uh, steam, which was everywhere, uh, while uh, in the Muslim world, uh, a new form of identity as Islamism shaped, particularly after 1989, which is uh, when uh, communism fell on uh, 11-9, and then that would be 9-11 later, uh, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, but few people remember that this was a consequence of the uh, Red Army uh, fleeing Kabul in uh, of February. You know? Communism was defeated by, uh, by Mujahideen, or so-called freedom fighters, who were jihadists, paid uh, by Saudi Arabia, trained and equipped by the why did not did uh, no one notice at the time? Because the day before, on Valentine's Day, nineteen eighty nine, there was the fatwa by Khomeini against British citizen or British subject Salman Rushdie, which was a very important. Because why did he do that? Because the, the uh, jihad in Afghanistan was a Sunni jihad um, sponsored by Saudi Arabia. And this was this this took place in the competition for hegemony over Islam between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Iran won the media battle with the fatwa, whereas the Saudi uh, won another battle it would be political. But they were very frustrated, and uh, the Ben Ladens and the others were extremely frustrated by that. And then, nine eleven was in a way a tit for tat against the fatwa of Rajdi. And the eleven nine, uh, uh, the fact that the eleven nine was not credited to to jihadists, uh, generally speaking, though they thought they were the cause. Now, this created a major shift, and within Europe, it sort of uh, launched this uh, new concept that Europe was part of the world of Islam for Muslims living on its territory. Why? Because a fatwa that is a religious edict by a Muslim scholar, uh, is valid only on Muslim territory and is implemented on Muslim territory. So if a fatwa, it's a sort of coup de force, if a fatwa uh, targets someone who lives in Britain, then uh, Britain is part of Dar al-Islam for Muslims who live there. This is, why, this is the, the new idea of 1989. And this was, of course, taking shape in Britain particularly, 
with you know the rush day affair the demonstrations the auto da fe or the satanic verses in bradford and everything but in france there was very there was a faint echo uh, by british standards of the rush day affair but in the in the fall of 1989 while everybody was busy with the uh, berlin wall the french were, were uninterested and they were mostly focused on on the Cray affair k is a little also in the outskirts of Paris, where three young pupils came, female and Muslim pupils, with uh, headscarves or veils or uh, hijab, saying that they considered now, and this was the shift of the Muslim Brother main organization in France, the Union of Islamic Organizations that was previously called in France, and this now would say of France. Why did they do that? Because they considered, by the same standards as Khomeini in a way, but on a milder uh, dimension that there were now Muslims who were French citizens, born and educated in France, and hence they should be entitled to follow the laws of Islam, of Sharia, uh, as far as they were concerned, i.e. Um, they should be allowed. And this was also something that had to do with the freedoms guaranteed by, by the French Republic to wear uh, uh, scarves uh, in schools if they so wanted, because it was what they said their religion taught them. And this is where the clash happened, with the, the school saying, no, uh, the school is a secular thing. If you want, uh, you know, religion has nothing to do there, do it outside. But uh, And also the desire not to part a classroom between kids who were uh, supposedly, uh, who were, would be clad into a pre, uh, um, an ascribed identity. I mean, uh, you are Muslim, you are Jewish, you are Christian, you are atheist, you are whatever. And instead of building the nation out of its different components, you would have a, fra a juxtaposition of fragmented communities. So that raised a huge amount of um, problems. Uh, then in a big rift on the two sides of the Channel and the Atlantic, France was... Uh, attacked as racist, uh, Islamophobia, then a, a, a pseudo concept that was created in Britain actually at the time by Muslim, by British English speaking Muslim brothers, would be applied later to France as the epitome of Islamophobia. French laïcité would be a new fascism, anti Islamic, and what have you. And uh, for 15 years, you had uh, school mistress and mistresses. Um, going from uh, school to uh, courts because there were uh, uh, a number of um, court judgments that were passed pro and con and so on until there was a law finally in 2004 prohibiting um, the 15th of March 2004 prohibiting uh, the wearing of uh, ostentatious religious signs in school by whichever religion. Uh, this raised another type of scandal uh, worldwide, but uh, then the school system were functional. And uh, kids who came to uh, to school with the scarves or veils or hijabs huh, would take them away when they entered school and they uh, would put that back on, on, in the street if they, if they so wanted. So this is, in a way, what has created the controversy, if you want. And... Um, the intellectual controversy on uh, that opposed mainly both sides of the Atlantic, the so-called pluralist democratic societies of uh, of uh, Britain and America, based mainly on the Protestant tradition, opposed to the sort of uh, Catholic and uh, Napoleonic conception of the uh, of the French on the other side. Um, and this led to philosophical debates and everything, and uh, also uh, sort of uh, where um, the, uh, the the actualization of very old uh, fault lines uh, uh, between France and Britain and France and between uh, the U.S. And, and France and so on and so forth. And it also, in a way, um, it was... Um, uh, you know, uh, American universities in particular and British universities by some extent were, uh, should I say, contaminated or infected by something called French theory, which is uh, called uh, such uh, a thing out, outside of France, of course, only, and uh, such a name, and uh, mainly uh, a reading of Foucault and Derrida, who did not really say what what is... Uh, uh, 
what they are, uh, what is assigned to them under the the Egypt and French theory, uh, that um, you know uh, you should uh, you sh- you should have a, a pluralist uh, society uh, that the state actually is authoritarian, is necessarily fascist, and what have you. And I, we have no time to discuss that into detail. And uh, uh, so the the funny th- uh, the the funny point, if I may say so, was that uh, those who in uh, on American or British campuses incriminate France do that on the basis of things that were originally <laughs> written by French, yeah. uh, was and translated uh, in English, although it was difficult to translate, and particularly Derrida, whom you would have to translate into understandable <laughs> French at first, but this is a So this is to, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, if I may say so, uh, this is how I view the uh, the uh, the sort of uh, of rift uh, and this, the 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 perception of the, the way France is, is perceived in the in uh, in the U.S. and uh, uh, but this this debate now is is permeating French society too and. Um, uh which i mean uh, the field of uh, of studies of uh, of muslim societies and in, in islam whether it be outside of france and or in france um is is heavily divided be- between those who like uh, for instance olivier roy who's the champion of the scam mm-hmm. consider that you do not have to know arabic to understand what happens in the french banlieues that these are phenomena of exclusion and that uh, the issue is not that there would be an, uh, a radicalization of Islam, but an Islamization of radicalism. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? You know, the infrastructure is, uh, is radicalization, which is due to social conditions, to, margin, uh, to marginalization and to exploitation and whatever. An old, if you wish, left-wing or uh, social uh, classes opposition, which is now using the language of Islam because this is a language which, which is available mm. in, in the toolbox, mm. right, right? It has nothing to do with Islam, nothing to do with Arabic. Hence, do, you, do not, you don't have to care about the superstructures. Something like, you know, that, was, that has some Marxian, um, Marxian uh, taint. And uh, uh, Olivier Ra was a, was a Protestant and a former Maoist also. So maybe mm. this has... has uh, uh, this has uh, influence. So if, uh, if I remember well, the case made by Olivier Roy is the people who are fighting in the name of Jihad would have been in Action Direct 30 years ago. They would have been in the Red Army groups. Essentially, you know, this, this radicalization has changed um, silo. In color, yeah, from, from red to, to green, but it's the same mm. process. And uh, uh, the, the, the opposite view, which uh, I proudly uh, <laughs> held, Hold is is that uh, um, I, I do not at all deny that the uh, uh, social dimension is very important, and I, and I did a huge amount of field work uh, both in French values and, uh, and and everywhere. But I listen to what is being said by actors, and I, I decipher it also not only in the con- in the context of uh, of uh, so the you know the social dimension. Uh, unemployment, uh, urban marginalization, so on and so forth, but also uh, trying to uh, decode it using uh, the emic codes, if you don't want to use the indigenous uh, world codes. And this, of course, is important because you do not identify yourself and your enemy uh, if you if you think in Marxian terms or in Islamist mm-hmm. terms. Uh, you're going to find the capitalist or, or the bourgeoisie and uh, self-style yourself as a proletariat is not the same as to identify yourself as um, Mustadaf and identify the other as Mustakbir. And, you know, I'm using those terms in, on purpose because this has a lot to do with the Iranian revolution. Shariati was... Uh, the scion, Shariati, who was the scion of a religious uh, Iranian uh, family and who studied in France with a French famous Orientalist at the time by the name of Jacques Berg, mm. translated or partly translated, probably with Abu Hassan Abu Sadr also, uh, a very famous book by um, a Car- French Caribbean psychiatrist by the name of Franz Fanon, 
who lived in Algeria, who was uh, sided with the National Liberation Front of Algeria, who was, who was a third wordist, and who used Marxist concepts to uh, describe the world system. So there were countries that were oppressed and others who were oppressors. Mm -hmm. And Sharia, in order to make those categories understandable, palatable by the Iranian uh, crowd or readership, used uh, Islamist categories to translate that. He would translate oppressors as mustak birin, which means arrogant, the symbol being the pharaoh, the pharaoh or the Shah of Iran uh, for what it is, and uh, the others being the mustadafin, i.e., it's usually translated as the disinherited by the weak ones. And, you know, for instance, during the Iranian revolution, the, the, the bazaar merchants who were by no means oppressed uh, socially or economically became part of the Mustadafi, mm. you know. So it allowed them to pass an alliance uh, between a pious uh, middle class and the young urban poor against the uh, the arrogant Shah, mm. see. So it, it re the codes are different. And the same is true, you know, uh, the uh, proletariat of, of yesterday in France would not uh, single out uh, Jews uh, and go and kill uh, Jewish uh, pupils uh, because it would uh, help uh, mobilize the, the masses against the, against the state, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is something that maybe the Nazis would have done, but uh, not exactly on the same count. And they, uh, they would not uh, target... Um, uh, people of color uh, as traitors uh, because they thought, uh, you know, uh, uh, just they were just like apostates. So this is, this I believe, even though, you know, there are always uh, congruences between uh, different ideas, you cannot totally shun the ideological dimension. I mean, in order to understand a phenomenon, you have to shun it. The, the reason why uh, uh, this was shunned, I believe, by uh, Olivier Roy and his followers, those, was that uh, they took sides. I mean, they decided that they were on the side of the, of the oppressed, uh, that the Muslims, to some extent, were like the proletariats of, of Marx, the, the vanguard of, um, of, of, of the future, and that uh, they were beyond any kind of critical assessment, which, mm. I mean, you can be, you can simply with whoever you want, but I believe that as 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 an analyst, as as an academic, you always have to keep a critical view on 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 social events and on social actors. I mean, you can uh, make, and this has been done a lot, of course, uh, a critical assessment of university. Consider that I am uh, a, a white uh, male chauvinist, supremacist, or whatever. Well, just prove it, uh, but you. This is, I mean, this, I'm, I'm, I, I can be an object of study, for instance. Or you, as well, why are you having this podcast? What's in your mind and who, who pays for it and whatever? This is all okay. But uh, you have to, to, to keep, to keep uh, um, an academic uh, view of it. You have, to, uh, to, you have to show what you're doing. You have to, to use... Uh, the language to, to understand the language of the object you study and and so on and so forth and this is not being done uh, by some people who just um, consider that you know the good thing is to be normative. You have another example in today's New York Times uh, where uh, the Paris bureau chief Adam Nossiter, mm. who's the, the the brother of a in my way a much better Nossiter, Jonathan Nossiter, who made a Mondovino, which I much prefer to his uh, his brother, uh, who's a sort of a fr French basher, a specialist French mm -hmm. basher, then considers what what is happening now in France is you know why why did did, did uh, the the teacher use those cartoons? This was offensive to Muslims. Then he uh, makes interviews with some scholars who, who of course, of his. Uh, Persuasion and uh, like Farhad Khosrowhava and others, always the same, uh, who are interviewed by him, and then uh, and then uh, this is uh, exposes uh, French uh, uh, hostility to Muslims in general and the like. So you know, this this of course uh, uh, 
uh, surfs on on the wave of uh, of what you have in a number of uh, campuses, particularly mm -hmm. in uh, in the U.S. And I would not be surprised you would not see a new uh, French bashing campaign, except that now Americans are um, uh, sort of focused on the Biden versus Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, uh competition so we may have a little rest for for some time so i i have a question about the issue of um of a banlieue which is an issue of much speculation and fantasy but you know quite well for your for your work there for your for your students who've been doing a lot of work on it as well can you can you walk us through what is going on here um it's first of all geographically we're talking about suburbs mainly of paris but also lyon and marseille um, how af influent is political Islam in these suburbs? Is it just is it just an, an informal control and cultural behavior on clothing, for example? Can the police still enter these neighborhoods? Was it too deep under the control of drug dealers and uh, political Islam? Is it safe for Jews to live there? What does the landscape look like, really? Uh, well, it's not only uh, Paris, Marseille, and, uh, and Lyon, right? It's everywhere. Uh, that is to say, even in, um, in in very small cities, I mean, uh, you have subsidized uh, lodgings, uh, which uh, which are usually inhabited by families from immigrant descent, uh, because they are usually uh, more numerous. They have more children, and uh, so they have access to uh, cheap lodging, which is of uh, adequate quality. It's not luxurious, but it's uh, it's okay mm. uh, at a very uh, cheap uh, price. And uh, so this has this phenomenon for uh, economic reasons to a large extent has created concentrations of populations of the same ethnicity, religion, and the like. And uh, uh, originally, uh, those area were peopled by uh, immigrants from inside of France, from say, uh, uh, who had a regional background or came from the, the countryside, but then they moved uh, when they could afford another uh, place to live where, that they owned. Then it was peopled by uh, immigrants from Spain, from Portugal, from Italy, from Poland, who moved uh, when the first uh, people from Algeria and particularly black Afri Africa started to arrive. And now uh, this, uh, those um, uh, projects, if I may say so, use the, the uh, American uh, parlance, uh, uh, would, um, uh, would become, would concentrate uh, more and more the, the, the last waves of immigration. So now you have uh, refugees from uh, Syria, uh, people who came from Africa and so on and so forth. So there is sort of downward spiral in terms of uh, access to uh, income, uh, size of families, and uh, and the like, which uh, which creates endless problems of uh, of marginalization. Uh, also, uh, because uh, jobs are scarce, uh, the uh, drug uh, dealing economy has become the main resource in many of those areas. And uh, on top of that, then the, the language of uh, social claims uh, that to some extent uh, was, um, was controlled when there was still work by uh, the Communist Party, the social, uh, uh, the unions uh, that was under its control now that there is no no work anymore uh, is being recoded and rebuilt in terms of uh, religious dimension and in islam so this is not to say as wab would have told you that you know uh, islam just replaced communism uh, the replacement uh, took place while the definitions of the self were completely uh, reshaped and uh, while the the gender relation the relationship between uh, between genders change entirely, communists were never interested in in uh, the seclusion of women or in their veiling or everything. On the contrary, and um, so this this is not uh, this does not limitate. I mean, what happens in the, in those uh, banlieues? And I, 
I did, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of field work in uh, 2010, which is now for almost 10 years ago, uh, after the, the, the huge riots of 2005, to try to understand what had ignited them. And uh, in there, you know, you, you, you see a number, a lot of people who uh, some have access to work, uh, some are uh, secularists, uh, uh, they uh, increasingly take part into municipal life and so on and so forth. So it's not, it's not a black and white uh, story with the rest of the country. Uh, it's it's more an issue of uh, having uh, gray gray zones, and and there's a huge uh, state funding. I mean, most of the <coughs> of the of the high rises have been either destroyed uh, and rebuilt if they, uh, if they were not. Uh, uh, sound for um, for uh, for a living in it, in them, or, or or they were renovated and the like. So uh, the 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 very landscape of the banlieue has changed tremendously from the say uh, the late two uh, thousands uh, in terms of between two thousand two thousand ten to to the late to, to today to twenty twenty. Uh, it's uh, but. Nevertheless, the uh, as long as uh, integration in the in the in the workplace cannot really uh, create another uh, inclusive uh, culture, then you have those uh, those phenomena uh, that build a sort of alternative uh, worldview, uh, which uh, makes a break uh, with. Uh, uh, with the fabric of of society, considers that uh, you 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 have to separate yourself. And uh, uh, when Macron mentioned the separatism issue, uh, many people, including myself, were hesitant of what it meant. But uh, when you look precisely in the in the the Islamist uh, uh, parlance. Uh, in Arabic, there, there is a, there, there is a, a, a syntagm which is extremely uh, significant, that is used by Salafists, uh, Muslim brothers, and jihadists alike as the sort of cornerstone of their uh, social and political view of the of the faith, which is called in Arabic el wala wal bara. El wala means allegiance, exclusive allegiance. To uh, to Allah and uh, to uh, the sacred scriptures of Islam in their most rigorous uh, understanding, their most rigid and literal understanding, and bara'a means to sever oneself from, or mm. in, uh, in in slang in French slang, se désavouer d'avec, to disavow oneself from. It doesn't sound right in French either. It's a translation from the literal translation from the Arabic, just like Salafism is a literal understanding of Islam. Uh, it says it means that you you have to break with the infidels, you have to break with the apostates, you have to break with whoever uh, does not uh, follow. That uh, those who don't follow uh, the the true path are either kuffar, i.e., infidels. Uh, or uh, apostates, mortadin, or uh, uh, people who associate God with another, mushrikin. And uh, all in all, in the most literal understanding of the religion, these deviations are sanctioned by death, mm. uh, by the death sentence. And so you have this whole atmosphere, and depending on who is in control, of the mosques network in the uh, in the such an area in, a, in so, such and such area, of uh, the gyms, of the benevolent association, the charities, in, of the uh, of the gyms and everything. Then you have this atmosphere which is created, which is an atmosphere of severance mm -hmm. from mainstream society, and and in the name of the wala of the allegiance to uh, the most rigorous understanding of uh, of Islam as proselytized by those guys against the majority of French Muslims mm. who are not interested in that. But, you know, there is a lot of pressure, which is uh, they are ashamed and everything for that for that reason. And this, this creates what I call the atmosphere 
an atmosphere which is duplicated and which is echoed um, in the uh, in the digital mm. world, because then you know uh, when when kids who are socialized in those networks who spend their time on their smartphone uh, looking for uh, websites uh, or uh, Twitter uh, or, or tweets or Facebook pages that belong to such communities of uh, Islamists, Salafists, Jihadists, and what have you, they build a sort of Weltanschauung, a worldview which is already constituted, which is separated, mm-hmm. which is separate. And when they get into the school system, they feel that they're on enemy territory mm-hmm. and uh, that mm-hmm. they have to keep a defensive uh, attitude towards the school, which is perceived as a, a sort of pernicious system, which will inculcate in the kids and the pupils' minds those terrible ideas of secularism, of uh, freedom of speech, and everything, which are um, uh, blasphemy, mm-hmm. because uh, what is important is al wala, which is obedience to uh, gods to Allah in its most rigorous form. And this is this sort of clash of culture that was already there starting in 1989 when the three kids, the three girls with the younger female students with uh, hijabs came into schools to nowadays uh, with those parents uh, belonging to those uh, uh, Islamist groups or pro-Islamist groups who then come into the school and say, no, you should uh, oust this scoundrel because he does not is not allowed mm. to be a, a teacher. And these are the values that we want for our, our children. So, you know, this is, this is challenging the, the very core of the, of the, pro, of the sort of the, of the vision of education in, in, in France. It comes at a moment when, uh, of course, as is always the case, uh, teachers are underpaid. Mm. Uh, and um, they they have uh, much higher in general cultural um, ambitions, but um, they actually because of their wages they uh, belong to uh, the very very low middle yeah. class, if not to 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 the working class. So there is also this discrepancy, this feeling of malaise within uh, within the teachers' community. Some of them. Actually, sympathize with the um, with the Islamists, whether mm-hmm. they are um, themselves from uh, the Muslim creed. Some of them, not all, and many many Muslim teachers just hate the guts of the Islamists yeah. because of the pressure they put on them, saying yeah. calling them traitors, calling their names all the time. But you have a sort of uh, a, a, a rather a wide uh, former lefty mm-hmm. movement. Uh, that sees in in Muslims the, the new the proletariat of the new millennium, and like you know uh, there was this famous uh, uh, British Trotskyite was it Chris something Hartman I think um, who wrote this book uh, way back when I was young before you were born called the Prophet and the Proletariat mm. uh, mm. that said that uh, you know the world Allahu Akbar was the, was what was uh, workers of the world unite before. Mm. Mm. And, what this is what we call in French the uh, the Islamo gauchism uh, persuasion or the Islamo lefty uh, groups, mm. uh, which uh, of course is also being a big uh, a big bone of contention in in French academia today. Yeah, and and that's and that's also uh, one of the more kind of under explored and undercovered, um, as you say, contention points uh, underlying this 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 whole issue that um, Anglo Anglo speaking um, English speaking media are really failing to pick up on. These are uh, dead angles. These are things that uh, English journalists, Br- British and American, whether they they report from Paris or from uh, the English speaking world, they're really not seeing these things and they're not picking up on them. And and one of the benefits of having you on the show, um, Mr. Kippel, is that you're really helping uh, our international audience, mostly English speaking, to really grapple with the, these deep 
um, these deep tensions within French society that are just undercovered and, and underreported. My exit question, although I think Francois is probably going to have a, a follow up, but I, I wonder if there's what would you um you know I. I the first uh, example that comes to mind was as recently as this uh, very case when um, the very day that Samuel Paty was beheaded, uh, the New York Times' headline that day was uh, police fatally shoot French teacher, uh, as, if the, yeah. as if the fact that this innocent victim had been, um, as if the fact that the, the uh, my apologies, the perpetrator of this crime is that the fact that he got um, shot by the police was the main story and not the fact that he had in turn killed a, an innocent man. So, and that just goes to show the disconnect with English media and uh, English speaking media and, and the French context. So I wonder if, what would you tell uh, our audience in, in Britain in America, what would you kind of warn them uh, about? What would you, what would be your, um, your prejudice against the kind of um, media that they read? What would you tell them, to watch out for when they're reading up on France from those media sources? Well, it's, uh, you know, this, it's a natural tendency to see the other through uh, your own lenses uh, and uh, to use your own categories. And um, this is something I was confronted to when I started to, to study the, uh, the Islamic world and, you know, those Islamist movements. Uh, the the concepts that were at my disposal when I was in my twenties uh, were uh, the, the the English language and Protestants uh, concept of uh, fundamentalism and the French concept or semi concept of integrism. One uh, related to the story of American and English, but mostly American Protestantism. And the other to uh, you know the, the breakaway in the in the in the Catholic uh, Church by Monseigneur Lefebvre and a few others, and this was applied as a metaphorically to what uh, took place in in the in the Muslim world. And this is why I thought because I had learned Arabic, I had learned the language, so I tried to make the effort to use the indigenous quote-unquote concept that the people I studied were using. Not that I take them at face value, because they say we are the Islamic movement, i.e. we represent all Muslims. That, I added an S and a T, said they are the Islamist movement, you, uh, showing that, you know, the, the scope of fundamentalism and anti-Gris did not cover everything, that the metaphor missed the mark to a large extent, that it was not a concept, it was just a, a preconception or a pré-notion to you, Durkheim's parlance. And by the same token, uh, I, I wish that, you know, uh, when American journalists uh, and some American journalists uh, describe uh, French society, uh, they would try to understand uh, what comes out uh, of, of that society and not portray it through the lenses that they think will speak better to their readership in uh, in uh, the upper west side. Uh, and this is, of course, more complicated. It's an effort to make, but uh, trying to understand uh, how uh, X, who is not you, uh, thinks, functions, it's not a means to, to alienate him and to... Uh, to otherize, if, if I may use this theologism, him. But it's it's a way to understand that uh, uh, every people or every group is a blend of different cultures, atmosphere, to use a word uh, by Bruno Latour, who I'm not sure would like me to use it, but let me borrow it from him. And, um, and uh, um, history, uh, reaction to to the tragedies of the modern world, and so on and so forth. And if you, if we reduce it to, to preconceived tools, uh, we miss the mark, and this leads to uh, to war. And I, I have one one last question. I don't want to get too technical because we could talk about it for a very long time. But we talked a little bit about Emmanuel Macron's law on Islamist separatism. Um, without going too much into the details. What do you think of a general philosophy of a text? It was, it was, it was heralded for being a very balanced um, speech uh, a few weeks ago. Does it seem like it's a bit, um, um, how can I say, um, a bit underwhelming given the scale of a challenge ahead? What do you, how, how, do you, how do you feel about this, um, this law and the speech that went with it? 
Well, strangely uh, enough, uh, I guess that what happened in Conflans Saint Honorine proved uh, the point mm -hmm. of the Macron speech. And uh, his aim was to say, uh, we uh, should now understand the atmosphere. And uh, how uh, do we end to, uh, with those jihadist uh, uh, attacks? You know? uh, it's not only an issue of police tracking an organization or a secret service uh, uh, dismantling this or that group. It's, uh, try we have to understand how, how this way of, of thinking is being disseminate, disseminated. And uh, this poses a huge amount of questions. I mean, because it is an arbitration between freedom and security. Mm. Do we consider that we have to restrict our freedoms because we feel that the nation is in danger? Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is something that we have to do because of, of COVID-19. I mean... Uh, we can, we now in Paris we uh, have to be at home at nine otherwise we're fined. Mm -hmm. You have to wear a face mask, which uh, many people consider is a, is an attack uh, on uh, civil uh, on individual liberty and so on and so forth. And uh, to what extent does <coughs> the threat of um, of the nature that we saw in Conflans Saint Honorine? justify some uh, reassessment of, of our public liberties. Uh, this may be temporary, <coughs> this may last longer, and this is why I, um, I believe that we have to have a debate, mm -hmm. not only in Parliament, because it's going to be a, a bill and then a, an act, but um, also within society. And, uh, you know, in 2003, Jacques Chirac had gathered this uh, committee of... Uh, of wise men, supposedly, the Conseil des Sages, or I don't know how you say that in English, mm -hmm. uh, which was the Stasi Committee, not because of the infamous German, East, uh, German Stasi, but because he was, it was headed by a state councillor called uh, Bernard Stasi, mm -hmm. and from Italian descent, actually. I, I was a member of it. And uh, during uh, six months, we, we had... Um, uh, a number of interviews with people from all walks of life to understand uh, what we could do to deal with this issue of uh, ostentatious religious signs were in school and the challenge to secularism. And at the end of the day, even though the law, of course, was uh, criticized, uh, that we suggested by, by some, nevertheless, it functioned. Uh, and you know the, the the schools were not plagued by uh, by those uh, wearing signs or not anymore. Nowadays, uh, there is uh, there again the, the schools are, are the center of the of, are the focus of the, of the crisis, and uh, this is of course uh, of importance to everybody. Uh, there are many more uh, Muslim uh, kids in school, pupils in schools now, because because of of, of different uh, growth. Uh, most Muslim families, uh, particularly if they came of late, have more children, and there are much there are many more uh, young people from Muslim descent in the age groups zero to twenty than there are in the uh, sixty five to mm -hmm. to the end, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so the the numbers of the demographics have changed also in in, in thirty years, and um, the challenge is the, is a, is, a, is of different nature. And I, I believe it would be important not to leave it only in the hands of the of the politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I a suggestion I made public, but I'm not sure uh, um, uh, that it will be followed. And you know. Uh, as we, we have a, a saying in French that says, nul n'est prophète en son pays. No one is a prophet in his, in, in his own land. I don't know whether that exists in English or not, but I hope it's explicit enough. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Capel. Uh, I hope you'll be a prophet outside of France then, in the US and the UK, and whoever's listening to this. I, I highly recommend anyone to go and buy uh, out of Chaos, uh, Gilles Capel's la la latest book on political Islam and its rise to power over the past 40 in, years. In English, it's Away from Chaos. Away from Chaos. 
Um, and uh, Professor Kippel, thank you very much. My pleasure, and I wish you the best for your, your great uh, podcast. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Well, that's a wrap, and uh, Professor Capel uh, is out. Uh, Francois, what did you think of this episode? Well, it, first, first of all, it was, it was great having my former professor, mm-hmm. Jean Capel, on this podcast. He is uh, he, t- he has, always has so much things to say about all these issues, and uh, we could have talked about it for another two hours, um, possibly, because there's no stopping him once once he once he starts. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought one of the most interesting concepts he developed is. He, he worked a lot on the idea of different waves of jihad. Um, he talks about how the first wave was especially against Afghanistan, uh, in Afghanistan against the USSR, and how it was fighting a foreign enemy. Uh, and, then, and then there was a second wave in which the foreign enemy changed. It went from, from the USSR to the United States. And, then, and then, they, then they got crushed in Iraq. They got crushed in Afghanistan in the first, in the first place. And so they changed their strategy and went to a less hubristic model mm. and focused more on creating local networks, the rest of it. That's, that's the ISIS model. And now, now that ISIS is, is uh, well, it's not entirely down, but it's, it is uh, politically the structure built in, in uh, Iraq and Syria is down. Um, there is now, there's now space for a kind of new movement. Um, and what ISIS could provide, the training could provide... Uh, the the thinking behind the, the jihadist attacks we've seen over the past five years, what we're seeing nowadays is different. It's what he called the jihad of atmosphere. Essentially, mm. what you're having is people, very kind of very deconcent- deconcentrated means, uh, become radicalized with some contacts with the outside world, some human contacts, but pretty limited. And through kind of vague instructions by people 10,000 kilometers away saying, you know, we should attack the Jews. Uh, we should attack the. We should attack symbols like Charlie Hebdo. The rest of it, you get people with little to no connection end up taking a knife, taking a car, uh, making a making a craft bomb, whatever they can do, and they start attacking symbols. So I think it is a very interesting um, evolution. It's it's the idea of a lone wolf, um, mm-hmm. which is which has always been contested, but now it's being pushed. Uh, and I think this this concept of atmosphere jihad captures this idea well. Yeah, absolutely. And what I thought was the the main takeaway for for our audience from the episode was, you know, Kepel is is very um, uh, eloquent when he traces the history of Islamism and and particularly how it went, as you said, how how it went from being sort of a foreign, malign foreign influence to being something that can grow out of thin air in in countries of the West. Um, So I I thought that was certainly an interesting part of the, the episode. I'm also very glad we got to touch on this whole issue around the foreign media. And for someone yeah. like Kapel, who has worked on these issues for so long and having to deal with international reporters, English reporters, American reporters, I, I, I could totally tell that this is a pet peeve of his. Yeah. I mean, you can you can really sense that there's really a disconnect. There's a misunderstanding. There's there's um, a misunderstanding uh, by uh, foreign media and, and the way they cover and the way they report on these stories. And, and again, we mentioned, I believe I said this in the interview that the New York times came out with this headline saying, uh, this, um, Chechen refugees was, um, assailed by the police as if that was, yeah, yeah, as if that was the heart of the story. I was also very glad, you know, um, that, well, this is something we didn't so much get into. Uh, it would have gotten perhaps a little too complex, but my sort of, it, it, it would seem as though it's not only foreign media uh, that is failing to accurately grasp uh, this phenomenon. I think that people within France were also a little confounded by this. I think, as you and I were discussing before jumping on, online, uh, some people in what Gilles Kepel calls the Islamogochisme, these uh, leftist groups that are also very wary of, an, of anathemizing um uh, immigrant communities are, and they're kind of like treading this fine line between condemning, mm-hmm. obviously, extremism as everyone and all of us should do, but without sort of, without seeming to uh, stigmatize um, Muslims as a whole in France, which I think it, no one really is doing. But um, so, you know, it, 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 I, I was hearing there was a demonstration a couple of days ago. I wonder if this was um, how broad of a spectrum of groups this was, but certainly a lot of people on the far left uh, with Jean-Luc Mélenchon's party yeah. the other day were out in the street saying, you know, oh, well, the, the, the Republic, the French Republic is, is stigmatizing Muslim minorities. 
And if you if you go down that rabbit hole, very soon you will be almost justifying some very ugly behavior. And 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 um, so I I think it's it's a lot more complex. Again, we are very justified in in, in calling out for, uh, foreign media for what uh, Kipel calls France ba- uh, France bashing. But at the same time, we should be um, looking inward and and trying to and trying to see who also doesn't seem to be. Um, it doesn't seem to have to have gotten the memo on on what is going on. Um, if, if, I'm, if I'm making the most generous case for for Jean Luc Mélenchon in the far left people, it is that he's the last bridge between uh, these communities and the kind of traditional political arena. And mm-hmm. he says, if we're being too harsh with them, we're going to break any kind of connection we have. So I think that's mm-hmm. kind of the most generous case you could make. Um, he says, you know, it, it's if you think you'll 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 end up uh, bridging the divide by just um, putting very strict measures, you're wrong. So he, he might have a point here, but there's also a kind of very kind of purely electoral reasons. If you look at all the MPs from Jean-Luc Mélenchon's group, a lot of them are uh, elected in uh, Parisian banlieue or the Quartier um, mm. Nord of Marseille. You know, and it's complicated. You can't, it's mm. not as easy for them electorally to take a strong position. It's Maybe it's cynical, but I think there's, um, there's some truth to it. One yeah. last thing, which is interesting, That's- for the first time, these kind of mass protests were challenged, not so much by the far left, but by, by kind of more right-wing um, uh, politicians saying, I, I don't want to lit another candle again. Um, mm. I'm, 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 I'm past that phase. I want, I want action. And, yeah. and, and very, you know, the uh, let's all sing Kumbaya and uh, sing Imagine by John Lennon phase seems, seems a bit hypocritic- hypocritical if it allows people from the far left who have been lenient on these issues to join the, the large Kumbaya party. Yeah, and I, I saw, I even saw, I think uh, Florian Philippot was was acting in, in the ways that you just described. I think he's splintered out of the National Front, the, the Front National, yeah. but he was, um, whoever, whatever party he's now with, was putting out a video of him saying, you know, this is not, this is the, the this is not a moment for, as you said, Kumbaya. Uh, we should be expelling anyone who is even remotely suspect of being associated with this attack sur le champ. Yeah. No questions asked. And uh, but let me ask you this because it was really interesting what you were describing. Wasn't um, wasn't Benoit Hamon the kind of the standard bearer of what you've described there? The this Islamogoshist. I remember when he ran in the socialist primary and ahead of 2017, he was oftentimes associated with that section mm. of the French left. Is that still true? It is true to some extent. I I, I don't want to be too harsh on, on Benoit Hamon, who's pretty much retired on on, on of French politics nowadays. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's more general, though. If you look at all the mayors, all the local elected officials in those, in, in, in those uh, neighborhoods in the banlieue, there's been a lot of compromise. And, and while kind of, it was kind of ideologically guaranteed, uh, how can I say, ideolog- ideologically uh, acceptable on, on the left more than the right, in practice, um, you also saw, saw plenty of center right and right wing mayors doing the same compromises to win re-elections because, you know, mm-hmm. if you're only a few hundred votes away from being re-elected, giving a bit of money to create the next mosque is a good way to get re-elected. Um, mm-hmm. So um, I, I don't want to be too harsh on, 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 on Benoit Hamon. I think, I think he's, he's a good example of um, some of these ideological tensions there, uh, but he's not the only one and he's not even the, the, the most, uh, uh, he's not even the worst on these issues. Yeah, and that that's really helpful that you've clarified that for our audience because yeah. the other side of the coin that I wanted to sort of show, and we didn't really have time to do this with Professor Kibel, was um, it, this isn't really only about foreign media. They surely get a lot of this stuff wrong, but there's also yeah. um, multiple perspectives on this, sh- this issue with, within France, which I think is tragic too, and maybe that's going to change, and I hope that we are going to see more unity from a sort of a broad kind of Republican front yeah. on this issue on how we should be dealing in. And we'll see how the how the ro- how the law that Macron was uh, introduced a couple of weeks back is going to be rolled out and we'll see if it if it works. But um, for what that's worth, I, I was uh, we're very glad uh, to have had this episode with Gilles Gebel. Um, please, again, rate and review on Common Decency on Apple Podcasts. That will really help uh, propel the show to even greater heights of popularity. And, uh, and thank you so much for listening to us, and we'll see you on another episode. See you next week.